Punch five C, and obviously this action here is kind of deep in the peninsula, but it's also in the dermis too. From low power, what I saw was kind of a mixed peninsulitis, so lobular as well as septal. But there's kind of these areas where there are kind of lymphoid aggregates. Yeah. <coughs> yes, and where do you get this much involvement? You say it's probably mostly lobular, you're right, it is involved in septa too, but it's really not just very septal. This is really hitting most of the lobules, even kind of wiping out mm -hmm. some of the lobules over here. And, uh, so yeah, lobular paniculitis, and then you want to decide whether there's vasculitis or not, and, and then if there's any other ancillary features, like whether there's uh, saponification or fibrous sort of Sort of fibrous type degeneration of, of the fat. Mm -hmm. um, so I I looked in the epidermis and then I looked in the dermis too, and there was some kind of uh, lymphoid aggregates around acrine coils too. That one area there. Um, that might even be a follicle too. Right? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so my first thought for this was kind of lupus paniculitis. Um, yeah. That, what about your second thought? Um, lupus paniculitis. <laughs> um, third, fourth, fifth, about twentieth thought. Yes, yeah, so this is really a fantastic, beautiful example, and especially if you get the changes of discoid lupus erythematosus like we have here all the time. Yeah, with the Yeah, with the smudging of the D junction, thickening of the D junction. Uh, this is just fantastic. It just doesn't get any better than this. And then when you look at the fat, you've obviously got this prominent lobular paniculitis consisting of lymphocytes and also some plasma cells and uh, and then we'll move around a little bit and you'll see that there's this hyaline fat degeneration this, this is really quite helpful if you see this in the context of, the, of everything else pretty much just makes a diagnosis of early paniculitis or lupus profundus so Really a fantastic example of it. I think you got some clinical pictures of it also. You know how to switch over to that? There's a way to toggle between these two. Did they show you just how to toggle? Yeah, here we go. So woody, indurated, sort of nodular appearing. They feel almost like nodules. And I, it's the most common paniculitis of the upper part of the body. Arms, face, that facial involvement is quite characteristic in my photo. So anyway, pretty straightforward diagnosis here. The only thing, next slide, that you have to consider in the differential, or the next one, is this uh, subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma. In my experience, you do not get this mummified fat with that. Mm -hmm. And also you get the... Uh, the rimming of the adipocytes. Yeah, the rimming of the cells with uh, lymphocytes actually acquired the ability to phagocytose other lymphocytes. So you'll see lymphocytes with other lymphocytes in their cytoplasm, which you do not see here. So it's really great. This is just a fantastic case. So the fellows deserve a gold star for choosing that one. Okay. <clears throat> So, anybody want to give this one a crack? Okay, so this is a punch biopsy of non equal skin. Um, what stands out is a proliferation in the dermis, the mid dermis there. Good. Um, of of these blue standing, but not very dark blue, almost kind of epithelioid appearing cells. Okay. Maybe a little spindled as well, with a lot of pigment or hemosiderin, either melanin or hemosiderin. Um, yeah. Given it's got sort of a gold color to it, um, and they're not as uniform, I would go with hemosiderin. 
Yeah, and if you rack down the condenser mm -hmm. and you do that and it's sort of refractile, that, that mm -hmm. helps too. So good, I agree with you. What about the cells? The cells are not pleomorphic. When I first looked at this, I was worried about maybe a melanoma that or something at low power, looking at the pigment and the cells. But looking at the cellular architecture, they don't look pleomorphic. To yeah. yeah, there's really not a lot of striking mm -hmm. exit color. What kind yeah. of cells do you think they are? I think they are probably um, like fibroblasts. Or... Yeah, good. Some of them are fibroblasts, some mm -hmm. of them are probably histiocytes. That's what we call Couple. multinucleated histiocyte there, mm -hmm. containing this hemocytorin in it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this kind of change Collagen here. Collagen trapping. Yeah, these the collagen muscle. Yeah. What's the diagnosis? Hemocytorotic, yeah. Yeah, this is a dermatofibroma, cellular dermatofibroma with blood and hemocytorin, which is uh, a simulator of a melanocytic lesion. So that's good. There's so a lot of different variants of dermatofibromas. There's a classic type that are just pretty much mostly uh, fibrotic, but then there's some like this that are more cellular and contain abundant uh, hemocytorin in them. So, just one of many different variants, totally benign. I think we've probably got a nice clinical photograph of that here. Let me switch over. Okay, so there you go. And uh, these can be really jet black. And uh, sometimes these can be hard. The type, the so called ankle type dermatofibroma, it can be the size of maybe even an inch or two. Really big. Next slide. So um, these are. Again, totally benign. This is the most important thing is that you don't miss this and call us something else. Slide. So yeah, you'd worry about the possibility of melanoma. Um, if you were thinking this was melanin and you really weren't sure, you could obviously do special stain like pearl stain for iron or Pontana Masson stain for melanin. But uh, this is pretty straightforward. You're going to need a stain on something like this. Okay, great. This is one that you don't see every day in your career. So if you don't know what it is, that's perfectly good, perfectly fine. Anybody have any ideas about this one? <coughs> I think it's a little punch biopsy. Uh, it's like unequal skin. Um, up here, it's hard to tell. I guess pathology is mostly in dermis. Uh, there's kind of some little strings of blue cells. Yeah, exactly. So it's a dermal based process. And you've got these sort of small bluish spindle shaped cells here. Okay, so when we go to high magnification, it really kind of get a better sense for what this is. Now what do you think? So they're kind of lining up. So when I when I see cells that line up like that, I think of some kind of met. Um, okay, that's they, one. So when you say lining up, that they're in kind of strands and kind of one behind yeah. each other. Good cords and strands of cells. Excellent. So that's one entity you need to make sure you're not dealing with when you've got that pattern. It's very good. So you want to think about a metastatic lesion. Some of them are a little bit atypical looking, kind of pointed and different shapes than the other ones. Yeah, some of them are kind of hyperchromatic. Yeah, like multi nuclear, almost kind of like a little florette. Okay, so yeah. So you think this is metastatic carcinoma? Um, yeah, but I'm not sure what kind. Let's see, something like that. Now, what's kind of missing? for metastasis here. I kind of think you might see some mitoses. Yeah. It's really even more, really all you have here is just kind of hyperchromatic chromatin of these cells. Some of them are multinucleated as well. There also are some blood vessels here. And you've probably never heard of this, but you're just starting out. So you probably need to get a, some consultation from one of your upper level colleagues. Consultation. <laughs> Anybody have any idea what this thing was? Mm -hmm. 
What if I told you it was a cluster of brown, dome-shaped papules in the leg of a middle-aged woman, symptomatic, been there for maybe several months. She was perfectly healthy, no breast cancer, no ovarian cancer, nothing else. Well, there's a thing called multinucleate cell, multinucleate angiohistiocytoma. Okay, because it kind of looks like a histiocytoma in a way. It's got uh, like a DF-like collagen, and it's got it's usually fairly well circumscribed in the dermis, and that's what this is. And it's fairly characteristic. They get these multinucleated cells, and it's vascular. And if you were to stain these cells, they stain like histiocytes. They stain positive with CD68, perhaps some of them with factor 13A. So this is one of those that you just may never heard of before. Now, there is a, a differential other than a metastatic carcinoma, one of some of the pleomorphic lesions, like pleomorphic fibroma, pleomorphic angiofibroma. This wouldn't really fit well with that because it's more diffuse. But the pleomorphic family of lesions kind of look like this also. But anyway, we have a clinical photograph of this. We can switch over to that. Who does that switch? Does oh. Jess have to do it? Oh. Can't we do it up here? Might be easier if we just control it up here. Yeah. Here we go. So this is what they look like. This one's really quite characteristic the one in the upper right hand corner. Kind of these small brownish papules are almost agmenated in a little cluster like that. And sometimes it can be one or two lesions. The next slide. So uh, again, they're totally asymptomatic. They don't have anything to worry about. The most important thing is if you don't overfall it or something more serious. And then we have one more slide. So uh, again, these pleomorphic lesions can look sort of like this, but just make sure that you don't overcall this as a cancer, because these are not that. So it's just probably some sort of reactive process. I'm not sure anybody really knows what causes this thing. It's a very interesting little entity, so I recommend going back and reading a little bit more about this thing. Okay, number 19. <clears throat> Remember this one? Who wants to give this one a go? I'll go. Um, so this looks like an excision um, of a nodule. Um, all the action seems to be in primarily in the dermis. Um, maybe a little thickening of the stratum corneum above it. Um, it's a uh, you know we always you guys always say it's not acral skin. Do you think this is not acral skin? Um, yes, I think it probably This time it really could be acral skin. But it's thickened, yeah, so yes, it is acral so, skin. This time it might yeah. actually be like near Bolar skin. It may not actually be on the palm or so, but it may be close to it, so. I don't appreciate any hair follicles either. Um, Let's so, switch it back to the snap. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, so did you think it was an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? Um, I thought it was uh, an inflammatory process. Um, okay. There seems to be a collection of inflammatory cells. Um, now these are inflammatory cells. What kind of cells did you think they were? I mean, lymphocytes, histiocytes, um, I think they're lymphocytes. lymphocytes. Yeah, some of them might be, but some of them have a relatively abundant cytoplasm, don't they? They're much larger, so uh, a lymphocyte is probably going to be maybe this size, that little teensy tiny little cell there or there. And these are way larger than that. And that abundant cytoplasm that's kind of pale. Okay. So, so let's let's say that uh, these are lymphocytes here. Yeah. They look like little tiny jet black dots at low power. Mm -hmm. But these cells up here, obviously not lymphocytes, are they? No, they're not. So what kind of cells are these if this is inflammatory? Um, maybe they're neutrophils then? Well, neutrophils would obviously have those, you know, multi-lobulated nuclei. Yeah, really and so these, these really have round 
nuclei with prominent nuclei within them. I think it's deocytes. That would be the one cell that they could be, is histiocytes. But if they're not histiocytes, actually some of them might even be kind of uh, a little bit atypical. Like that cell there, probably in mitosis. And there's a lot of pleomorphism of these cells. Here's another cell that's definitely in mitosis. Then, yeah, that's a little concerning then. <laughs> but not to it's always okay to switch, switch gears. You can always put it in reverse, back okay. up. I overshot the turn. I got to turn left okay. instead of right. Okay. No problem. So. Okay. Um, so then we should be concerned for. Um, some sort of malignant process. Uh, malignant process, yes, a neoplasm. And if it's, yeah, it could be malignant, probably. And if it's malignant, do you think it's more likely epithelial or not epithelial? Uh, non-epithelial. Yeah, it could be. Or, or if it's an epithelium, it certainly doesn't look like squamous epithelium or any of the classic anexal epithelial structures in the skin. So there are uh, things such as neuroectodermal cells that consider if you're an embryologist to the epithelium. So if this is a malignancy, and it sure looks like it now, doesn't it? All the atypical cells and all that. It looks kind of epithelioid. And some of the cells may be arranged even in these little aggregations here. What do you call when a cell sort of cluster in a little round a nest. A nest. So what do you what do you think of when you have a nested Malignant neoplasm. Um, we think about melanocytes. Yeah, melanocytes, like melanoma. melanoma. So this could be melanoma. Now, if it's melanoma, is this like a classic actual melanoma? Somebody yeah. is classic, but it is a skin. Yeah, what's missing for acral melanoma here? Um, I'm not quite sure. What if we, uh, yeah, there's no epidermal involvement, is there? There's almost a little grin zone between the epidermis and this ugly melanocytic neoplasm. And if you look at a low magnification, it seems to be relatively small. <clears throat> it's almost as deep as it is broad. And it's kind of round. It's still so what does that tell you? I, do we, I want to look. <laughs> yeah, it's a metastatic. Do we have an otoscope? And that's what this actually is. That. This is a metastatic malignant melanoma, and, and sometimes metastases yeah, can simulate benign lesions at low power because they are relatively small. It's they're often so pseudosymmetrical. And but there were some cells. Like I'm on Friday. It was and you start looking and say, oh my gosh, this is benign. It's obviously malignant. And then you start putting two and two together and you say, hey, it's probably metastatic melanoma. No I like her. And that's actually what this is. Or is there just like an incidental fibrocarcinoma on the other part? No, the other that's, just, that's just another. That's just another I was very confused yeah. as far as what was going on there versus the other. Yeah, that's that's just another piece. And the other thing okay. that it would have been yeah. you know, yeah. so they said. I heard her talk. She was like, it's not like I think. Completely different. Sometimes like scary looking. Person. She's just yes, way too tall. The reason they look scary yeah, like, is because they're spread that. throughout it's the like dermis. Okay. Not because they look like this. Okay, okay. It's a nodular aggregation of atypical cells. So that's a different reason why it's so malignant. Okay. So here you see, usually metastatic lesions don't ulcerate as much. But they mostly are kind of dermal nodules. Anyway, so this is metastatic melanoma in the next slide. So again, we've got these. <clears throat> Uh, these features here, but that probably from a histologic perspective, that top point is the most important the fact that you can get uh, they look almost as wide as they are tall. That's helpful when you're looking at a metastatic lesion involving the skin, almost like any kind of metastatic lesion, but especially metastatic melanoma. So, it's really helpful when you, when you see that. Okay, great. Okay, some of melanoma can be pretty poorly differentiated when metastasized to the skin. All right, so what do we have here? Okay. Yeah, that's an easy one. 30 resin. Yeah, he has to go twice because it's so easy for him. Um, so, this is a part of the This is not April skin. Yeah, what part of the body is it from? Uh, it looks like probably face. Yeah, face. 
blood a large sebaceous lobules without a lot of terminal air follicles down in the fat, so this is really perfect for the face. Now we always talk like about the cancer cyst, cyst or just fake cyst. Looks Yeah, really cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then when we Thank you. Want to make a diagnosis since we're talking about it? Looks like it's like being my head man. Name and sister, some of the lining. That's yeah. like. So, what kind of lining um, is present here? Uh, no. Did we send a couple other things off too? For him? Yeah, that one. I'm not sure how wide it is. No, no, no. He just had a lot. Of, we get a lot of frozen. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's not stratified epithelium. epithelium it's no, like, it's yeah. not. It's got maybe two layers yeah. of around some of cuboidal cells. Yeah, it looks like a duct or something like that. Yeah, or what, what's normal in the skin that kind of looks like this. This just happens to be a much larger um, cyst that's differentiating so in the same direction. Could look like this. What, which part again? So, uh, so yeah, it's so Here's a normal sweat gland. So what do you call it? Cyst. The so, difference for the sweat unit. So I thought this. I, I had two thoughts on this. Either hydrocystoma. Yeah. What's the other thought? The other thought was like miliaria profunda. I never saw miliaria profunda. Like. Yeah, and miliaria profunda doesn't usually give you a cyst. Basically, what happens there is you get plugging of the sweat glands, and they rupture, and you get inflammation around the lower part of the sweat gland. So uh, that's really more of an inflammatory process. So you're right. This is just a cyst, hydrocystoma, not milieu area, mm -hmm. which is an inflammatory, papular, critic condition. So this would just look like a skin-colored, translucent lesion, probably came in as roulat basal cell. They're often thought to be basal cells. Picture of that, pretty straightforward. So, yeah, you see why they think that they're basal cells? They look translucent, they're glistening. Take them off, nothing to worry about. Anybody know what the shop shoots the Sarge and Gold syndrome is? Don't everybody say it was. It's basically one of the ectodermal uh, dysplasias. They get Lots of these types of stomas, they get uh, ecrine cerebrofibromelanus like chains on their palms and soles, and it kind of look like a uh, uh, almost plantar periderma. You don't know what Gold's disease is, right? Are they going to bite up there? Yeah, this is true, Joe's. Focal dermal hypoplasia. Which? It's what? not purely hypoplasia. It's <laughs> it an abnormality of formation in the dermis, but they can also get hypostomas in that. So I would recommend learning those syndromes. The board loves to ask about syndromes. Right, Dr. Rainwater? A little bit, yeah. She just took it, so she's an expert on the board. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> okay, 21. This is a harder one. Uh, so this looks like either an excisional biopsy or a punch. Yeah. Um, looks like there's a lesion kind of centrally here that they were going for. Uh, there's some kind of, there's a little bit of perikeratosis overlying it. Um, it's a little bit crusted on top of it. From low power, it looked melanocytic Good. in nature. Um, Not really. That's where it got tricky. Um, I mean, it, it looks well circumscribed here. It doesn't look like it's spreading out. Uh, it doesn't look like there's, you know, adipotosis, lateral to the region. Um, the cells look very large. Um, so I started thinking something kind of in the spit nevus category, but then I was also looking at the rest of the patient's skin and I thought I was seeing a lot of solar elastosis. So I wasn't totally sure that this was a child. Yeah, um, good. But Excellent. obviously, you can get spits nevi that just weren't excised when the person was a child. Now, is, um, this, is this really symmetrical? Um, so, if you drew a line I right guess down the middle, no. Of this no, it's not, is it? No. And these nests vary in size and shape, and here they coalesce. We're kind of a large aggregation, mm -hmm. they also probably are 
forming a sensation. Yeah, and it didn't mature from top to bottom. Um, it, the cells were pretty large throughout the whole lesion. There's, it spread down the hair follicle. Yeah. Um, I was concerned for melanoma. I was looking for other areas that were deep where I didn't see much. I guess at the lateral portion over there, there was some kind of single cells. Yeah, there are some single yeah. cells here going out. So what makes this kind of tough? What's um, the main reason this is an easy slam dunk diagnosis here? Um, because I haven't so this seen all it, gave you was his I haven't seen enough of them yet. <laughs> But there's a reason. So what if you think, uh, what if you had like a deep, broad shade biopsy? Yeah. Um, and you can really see that there's extensive epidermal involvement and it's really quite asymmetrical. The punch almost makes it look benign. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't like punches, melanocytic lesions. You encounter a nevoid melanoma like this, and let's say you didn't have the uh, follicular involvement that's so helpful here. You can easily just call this maybe a nevus. If you just had this part right there, easily could be called a nevus. So that's one of the pitfalls of doing punch biopsies and melanocytic lesions, unless you're punching out the whole thing, which they clearly did not do here. If you look carefully over here, there's single cell involvement, some cells above the junction, some cells in the granular cornflake layer. It's pretty subtle. And you're right, it is on sun damaged skin. So if you get a Spitz's nevus or Spitzoid lesion on sun damaged skin of an older person, you better be super careful in calling it a Spitz. Yeah. And if somebody sends you back a diagnosis of that, be careful believing it. You may never look at another slide again after you finish your training, but you're going to get reports back. And if it doesn't make sense, you better put on the brakes because you can end up getting sued also if the dermatologist missed it. <coughs> And the metabolists may miss it because of a biopsy. Well, they're doing the best they can do, but if you kind of hamstring them with a punch biopsy, something that's four centimeters, and you give them like a three millimeter punch, don't be surprised if the diagnosis comes back wrong. So this is a pretty obvious melanoma, you know, when you start really looking at it, but it's tough because it's kind of nevoid. We've got a picture of a couple of nevoid melanomas here, probably of the three, that maybe middle one, I don't know if these really were even known in the literature, but anyway, they can look like a melanoma. They used to be called minimal deviation melanoma in the old days. So again, just be careful with some of these lesions because they can be symmetrical sometimes at low power, and you really have to look carefully to look for other ancillary features of melanoma here. So just as a teaching point, be careful of punching more anesthetic lesions. I'm not a big fan of it. Okay, this is a punch biopsy of non-equal skin. What stands out is um, kind of the pattern would be a superficial and deep mm -hmm. inflammation, a lymphohistiocytic. Um, some of it's centered around eccrine, glands, and nexa. And then also around and some follicles. Also around too. the follicles. And there is some follicular plugging. Okay. And some evidence of interface as well. Uh, pigment dropout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. And it's probably on the scalp. So it's probably disco jelly with alopecia. Mm -hmm. And so it's a nice example of low power of one of the lymphocytic infiltrates. So obviously there are a bunch of those, right? And what else is present here that helps you in distinguishing this, say, from polymorphous light eruption? What's this stuff? Mucin. Yeah, mucin. So if you see mucin in the dermis, now in this case it's such a nice example, and you've got a lot of ancillary features. You've got the interface change, you've got the interface membrane zone, you've got the follicular plugging, you've got all those features. So this, in this case, you really wouldn't confuse it with anything. So sometimes when you're grand rounds or something, and the professor asks you to kind of get the differential diagnosis of this, just like with the lupus profundus, you can say, well, you. You could think of the other five or six lymphocytic infiltrates, but in this case, because it's got all the ancillary features, you really wouldn't think about any of them. So this would be discoid LE, and you wouldn't even want to get a differential diagnosis. 
Dr. Popper, what are those? Are those adipocytes? Yeah, no, those are adipocytes. Okay. And, and, you know, that's been studied in the literature. Some mm -hmm. people think it's kind of fatty metaplasia. We see okay. that quite a bit. It's just something. In DLE? No, oh. uh, just in general. Okay. Uh, it's not specific for DLE. That's just kind of an ancillary finding. And I don't know why it happens. It's actually pretty uncommon. It's yeah, really, like, to be honest with you. It's pretty unusual to see that. We have some pictures of that too. So you all know what this way oh, looks yeah. like. Okay. So just make sure you know all the information about lupus, the association with um, systemic LE. Sometimes, especially subacute LE, can look a lot like dermatomyositis. So if you're doing a biopsy to distinguish between those two conditions, it's not the best way to do it because they can look very, very, very similar. So I'd rather you not rely on the biopsy to distinguish those. It's better to use other ancillary features like serologic studies and muscle enzyme levels and some stuff like that. Sometimes the best power to make a diagnosis is at low power. So what kind of biopsy are we looking at here? Uh, so imagine you're in the clinic, yeah. and somebody comes in and you think they've got this cyst on their scalp. Mm -hmm. What kind of technique are you going to use? Uh, excision. Probably. You could excise, but it's a busy clinic, and you know you got six patients waiting out there. You're going to set up for a full-fledged excision. You can do sometimes the birthing oh. method. Exactly. Yeah, what's that called? What's the birthing method called? What's the a medical term for that? Enucleation. Enucleation. Good. So that's probably what they did here, right? They probably took their little nick on the surface and they said, okay, let's get this thing out of here. And they tried to birth it out of there and it didn't come out quite as easily as the average one. It didn't just pop out like a typical cyst would. So, so I was. What's all this stuff? <clears throat> Um, what looks really dark purple, purple. Calcium. calcium good so it's calcified yeah so it probably felt kind of grainy mm -hmm. grist like grit gravelly what about this okay so it's uh, yeah it's very proliferative, right? That's a good term. Does that help you with the diagnosis? I um, I, I was having issues with this one. I, I, I issues. Don't, uh, well, we have a psychiatrist next door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought I, I thought it looked like a um, pilometricoma, like certain areas, like yeah, but it doesn't have some of the features of pilometricoma, does it? Not all. No That's shadow right. cells, no matrical epithelium, really. So I was like, is this is a thalmatrona or a, like... What if you just had this... Hylar tumor of the sort that I could... Hylar tumor. Okay, what's... You're getting closer. You're close. You said the first word before. Okay. So... Probably it's a proliferating pilar tumor. Proliferating pilar tumor. Good. Yeah, proliferating. <laughs> which, <laughs> which I couldn't find. No. Yes. I, I was like looking for through and I was like, really. It has multiple things. It does have multiple things. If you just had this one little area, it looks like a little cyst, isthmus catagen cyst. You know, so if you just had this one area, so say, okay, well, that's probably the basic building block of the entire region. And so if you go back to lower power, you see that there's really tons of those little cyst-like things like that where all the pseudo-epitheliomas hyperplasia associated with it. So this is all pseudo-epitheliomas, not true epitheliomas, pseudo-epitheliomas. And these are the rolls and scrolls areas? Yeah, yeah. But, but I haven't heard that term before, but that would fit, yep, if you want to use that. No mitotic figures, really. No striking atypicality. These lesions are benign. 
So you don't necessarily have to go back and re-excite them. A lot of guys do. Excuse me. They tend to recur. Um, they can rarely undergo malignant degeneration, just like any long-term uh, cyst or hematoma or benign an excellent neoplasm bleeding the skin long enough and it gets hit enough times with radiation or whatever it can gradually turn into cancer. So it's possible, that's one reason why people excise these, but this is not a cancer and it's not a pre malignancy. So this is what these lesions look like. They can sometimes be really pretty large, like that large lady's ear. So uh, they mostly occur on the scalp, but they also occur in other locations. So just and then calcification, even ossification. So anyway, just remember this lesion, also called a win. In the, the old country, they use the term win. Okay, this is a fantastic, beautiful, superb example of this also. This also. This is a punch by the... Uh, the thing that stood out to me was the epidermis was super pale. Yeah, and good. And it looked yeah, like there was kind of crusting, uh, dying, and so I thought of nutritional deficiency when I look at this first. Yeah, when you're well trained, if you see something like this, you can kind of jump to the diagnosis right away. And it actually is the diagnosis. But we have to make it a little bit tough on you. We have to come up with some other ideas here. So I thought about kind of like sandwich signs as well. I wanted to make sure that there wasn't tinea anywhere. Um, Looks like there actually might be some tinea. Okay. Now, let's say the guy really did have a Does that mean that? This tinea that that's here as well? You know, maybe, maybe that's. Yeah, could they? So if this was a kiddo, and maybe they had obvious nutritional deficiencies in their uh, acronymatized or path or something like that, they could get a secondary candidate with secondary So, but that shows you, and again, I, I, I think in this case it's called nutritional deficiency. I think the kid had no disease, so I think it was not really a question of diagnosis. But there's lots of organisms involved, so it's probably, it could be. Dramatifying could also be candidate possible, but it, it could be secondary. But there's no question that there's a lot of fungus. But let's say that they didn't have it. This, this could still be caused by the fungus, because fungus can do a lot of stuff. It could be this kind of pattern as well. So it's a good case, and you know, I presume that. Again, I don't know this case personally. Presumably, the fungus is just secondary. I don't know the case. case. It's been quite a while since it was diagnosed. So. But there's definitely some organisms here. What else can you do with this other than the Well, I That was the first thing I thought of, and then I moved on quickly. Um, uh, let's see. All right. You're saying what else can give you just a pale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. Um, so other things that I think of one, I have to go with color change, just doesn't look great for it, but EDP out there will just play the version of blue, so kind of give you that pale blue. Yeah, that's blue kind of blue. So that doesn't look really like for it. Anything that's causing kind of anything that's causing re epithelialization of the epidermis, I guess, is good. Do something similar. Yeah, but you see kind of the outer stuff is sort of taking it outside in, so maybe yeah. some kind of irritant reaction could yeah. also sometimes give you this kind of blue generation of irritation. Yeah, so, so acute yeah. spongiotic dermatitis yeah. causing yeah. vesicular stuff, maybe? That'd be a little less likely to give you this part. Okay. But, but yeah. let's say they applied some kind of irritant to it. That yeah. could give you that kind of response. All right. So, anyway, that's. So it's interesting that I, I don't know that I think we're trying to use this as an example of a nutritional deficiency disorder, but there's no question that's in front of us here also. So there's several different types of this, right? So the of this might look similar to the microscope. The micro MRI can look like it, and there can be like a little thing using more discurrent tinnocytes in that. 
So I have uh, efficiency, all I those things can be all of those similar, similar histologic features. Similar just to remember the that power that required the illness that we saw some psoriasis in my body. Psoriasis is long enough, it starts looking like psoriasis. Psoriasis. A lot like psoriasis. Psoriasis. Okay. Oh, it's not that tough for a guy like you. You can get this over. No problem. No problem. So, we have this. Here's the medical scheme. Um, I think the main issue we see here is in the dermis, which isn't really, I think that the weird shape of the epidermis has is because of the angle cut. Yeah, yeah, I agree. A lot of that's yeah, probably yeah, sectional. Well, there may be some epithelial hyperplasia. This condition is often associated with epithelial hyperplasia sometimes. What's, what do you see in the dermis? What do you see in the dermis? It looks pale. Pale. Good. Very, very pale. Now, why does a dermis look pale? Why does a look pale? some of the reasons. There are things that make it look pale. There can be. What kind of things make it look pale? Um, so, I guess it, I mean, it's been, I guess it, I mean, it's been, and replaced or intertwined with this type of and there's a ton of it. There's a ton of it. Okay. Now, right. what part of the body are you? Um. um so, any clues? Clues. What part of the body do you get these kind of blood vessels? Like? Okay, it's tiny and superficial like that. With thick walls. With that. With thick walls. It's almost a little tough. Probably the lower extremities. Yeah. Because there's stasis altered blood. There's stasis altered blood. They've got to hold up the blood and the leg of course it's standing. Stasis that sort of thing. So what's the diagnosis? What's the diagnosis? So, it looks like a deposition in the doctor. Um, and, uh, I, I was between I, I was sclerotic edema and sclerotic edema. Okay, now sclerotic edema, how much mucin do you usually get in that? You usually get in that. Not as much as you get. It's just small wisps of mucin. You're in the very thick collagen. Here you've got a lake of mucin. Yes. Yeah. 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 The problem yeah. yeah. is that sometimes yeah. I don't know how to interpret it. Weakness of the slide. Sometimes we see slides that are super old, and we see like fade things. So sometimes we're not going to give you super old. We're not going to give you super old slides here. We're going to give you full examples of diseases. This is tons of diseases. If you weren't sure, if you thought, well, there may be a fade slide, so we're looking for some cells within the two cells. What kind of cells are always accompanying lots of these? Yes, but what other kind of cells? Yes, but what other kind of cells? Yes, but what What's sitting inside yes. that cytoplasm? Yes. Mass cells. Yes. Mass cells. Yes. So if you see a lot of stuff that's going to use a slide or really using, start looking around and if you see mass cells, there's an odd. It could be a beta slide. It's a mass cell slide. This is pre-tibial myxedema. Beautiful example of that. Now, I'm not going to go through the differential diagnosis of all the conditions that you can get lots of use in, but there's a bunch of So, so look how thick that epidermis is. It's kind of papillated. So maybe some of that is real. And the last section is the epidermis. That's a little papillated. Pre-tibial myxedema. Okay? So, we need to know. We need to know. You know what conditions it's associated with. It's associated and uh, there's lots of things that can give you lots of use, but generally, so those in that list, probably something like maybe rim, maybe would give you possibly to get lots of use. Maybe it's generally if you just get like a mix of that, it gives you this much, but it's not going to give you lots of use. Sometimes mass cells are really useful. Okay, so that's the first thing. Yes, that's the first thing. Yes, that's the first thing. This one's 
kind of an interesting one. It's a little unconventional. I don't want to give this one a go. This one a go. Okay. Um, okay. So I wasn't quite, the shape was a little unusual. Um, so I presumed that it was a punch, but I wasn't entirely sure. Oh, yeah, that's a punch. You know, it's the world's best punch. Best punch. But, you know, punch. Kind of been trashed a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> um, I thought that there was, uh, there were some abnormalities, abnormalities in the in the epidermis. Uh, some epithelial hyperplasia like, a little bit, it's kind of crushed it a little bit. What about the dermis? Yeah, so the dermis is where the majority of um, the action is. Yeah, um, what's the pattern? Is it inflammatory or neoplastic? Inflammatory. And what's the pattern? Um, it is, well, there's diffuse, but it seems to be focused in some areas. Yeah, it's mainly kind of nodular and diffuse. So we're good. What kind of cells? There's uh, cells. Uh, some may be, but these uh, jet black small dark ones again are probably uh, lymphocytes. There's lymphocytes, there may be some polys in here, we may even see some eosinophils. And then we got something else, don't we? Is this normal material here? No. What is that? What is that? So there is some. Oh, it's darker than the red? Yeah, it's very dark. Yeah, know, it's, it's very brownish. Um, so when we see that color, we think of red melanin. You could think of melanin, but it's not jet black, is it? It's kind of when you get in higher magnification. It looks like there's particles. It's particulate. It's kind of slightly refractile. It's not perfectly refractile. Um, so mm -hmm. things that can give dark pigment in the skin, I mean, sometimes, it, it maybe if it's more superficial, you might think of something traumatic. Um, but it can even be deep and be traumatic, right? Okay. Yeah. So this probably is traumatic in some ways. Right? So what looks dark, brownish black, brownish black, or some skills up here as well. Um, so traumatic tattoo? Yeah, tattoo. I mean, it couldn't, I did not even get traumatic tattoos. Yeah. I mean, if you're traumatic, you so a the person decided they want to look pretty. Or maybe they want to put their girlfriend's name on or something like that, you know? So you got a tattoo, and you had a great reaction to it. So there's several different kinds of tattoo reactions. There's the granulomatous type that look like sarcoid. There's the segment of granulomatous type. And then there's just something like this. It's just kind of a diffuse, almost pseudo-anomatous reaction to a tattoo. Here. So this is basically just a general inflammatory tattoo reaction. Reaction to that. So this is why you don't want to get tattoos. Thank goodness they didn't do what I've got the right in the corner. That's causing an ulcerative reaction. So there's lots of different kinds of reactions for tattoos. Um, this makes this is nothing special. It just shows an unusual, diffuse, kind of almost pseudo lymphomatous type of reaction. And the one thing that you always want to make sure when you get an inflammatory response to a tattoo is that there's not an infection of some sort. So special stains, especially if it's brand new on those again, five, that sort of thing. Okay. This one's a fairly easy one. Uh, so punch five C. It looks very squared off. There's Good. this infiltrative process that you can see here from low power. I think it's inflammatory or neoplastic? Neoplastic. Good. Um, and it looked like there was kind of single filing of these infiltrative cells. So I thought about metastatic adenocarcinoma, probably breast or Good. colon or something. Okay, now of those, since you opened that Pandora's box. Yeah, so you seek it. Seven versus twenty you can do. How about just how about just H and E? Well, Good old fashioned, just looking at it. Okay, uh, it looks like it was forming ducts. There's in definitely some areas, ducts here. So I thought more breasts. But. Good. And what's you said colon? Yeah. What does colon look like? Uh, I mean, it should look, have like columnar epithelium. Yeah. Good. And then the so-called you know the dirty necrosis, the central dirty 
necrosis where you get the superficial portions of those cells necrosis. There's a lot more hyperchromaticity and, and usually necrosis is a common finding in that. Not so common in breast. So this is metastatic breast cancer skin. And these things can look like plaques, erythema, you know, there's several different clinical morphologies of that. Here's an example. When you feel these things, they feel really firm. Here's another example. It's so-called carcinoma pleuris. It's like a shield of cancer. So uh, again, that, that can really look like morphia. You can get an inflammatory pattern, which really almost looks like cellulitis. Of course, Paget's disease always associated with underlying carcinoma. So again, uh, they probably aren't going to ask you a lot about differential between the types of metastatic carcinomas. Breast is probably the most common. Okay. Uh, who wants to do this one? This is also an easy one. I don't know if it'll be easy, but I'll give it a try. Uh, it's uh, it's part like of the blood. body. Uh, what, scalp? Yeah, scalp. Big hair follicles. Yeah, it's still way out of the fat. Inflammatory or neoplastic? Uh, I'm going to say neoplastic. Okay, if it's neoplastic, I'm then you're... Yeah, good. <laughs> All right, what pattern well, I, thought, I thought that maybe it was kind of going after the hair follicles there. It is. It saying. is going after the hair follicles. Same. So that's one of the patterns of inflammatory skin disease, right? Yeah. Folliculitis and perifolliculitis. Yeah. So this is a follicular-based process. And what's going on in the follicle here? It's like it's, yeah, there's. Is that normal? Guess, or, no, it's like no. little lymphocytes that are inside the follicles. Are those lymphocytes? Um, no, they're, I'm not sure what those are actually. Okay. Anybody want to give them a little help? Hyphae. Hyphae. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and spores. And they're inside the hair shaft. So what's the diagnosis? So tinea capitis. Tinea capitis. Endothrix or ectothrix? Uh, endothrix? Yeah, endothrix. What's the most common organism to cause this? Capitis is tonsorans? It can be T. tonsorans, yeah. That's, that's probably the most common one that we see. Uh, occasionally we'll see, rarely, but you know, on the scalp, probably T. tonsorans would be the most common. What does it look like clinically? Um, it can just be crustiness or it can form the carry-on, which is kind of the big it body. It can cause carry-on, then you get a superficial, uh, lot of dense diffuse infiltrate in that. And then uh, actually you get the so-called black dot. <clears throat> we don't see that here, but these little broken off hair shafts right at the ostium of the you know, follicular ostium, like the teensy tiny black dots. And so when you look at, at these hair shafts here, you can see these aren't normal, so they're not going to grow out for long, and they're going to just break off the surface. So this can be a little black dot in this hair shaft. It's actually, probably three or four hair shafts that are involved here. So this is T. tinea capitis. Now, we sometimes see microsporum, but it's pretty rare today. The vast majority of these are, are from trichophyton. So, a good example of that. You'll never forget that as long as you live, so <laughs> be glad that you got called on today. A couple more here in the last few minutes. Let me give this one a quick go. Punch biopsy of non equal skin, so what? It stands out as it's almost square punch when I looked at it. Um, the collagen looks thickened. Okay, now what if this came from somebody that just had pretty thick skin on their back? Then. Mm, but there's a lot more going on yes. than this, right? I mean, yes, this is where the action is. Inflammation around the follicle there. There's uh, a very little bit of follicular involvement. It's also mm -hmm. superficial. Mm -hmm. And mid to deep. And what are these cells? Histiocytes. Some are. And lymphocytes. And lymphocytes. And any other cell? Mm -hmm. 
some plasma egos. Cells? And plasma cells, or eosinophils, neutrophils, plasma so cells. Mixed infiltrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what and might the diagnosis be? Um, could be an arthropod. Could be. What about all the plasma cells? Though? Does syphilis. that make you worry about <laughs> anything else? Syphilis, yeah. Syphilis, absolutely. It could be syphilis. Mm -hmm. so and the reedy do look a little slender in some areas. Not Does that help with anything? Helps with syphilis, maybe. Really? Apparently, apparently it does. I haven't heard of that one before. Yeah. I wouldn't well, use that as a criteria for <laughs> diagnosis. Because that just kind of depends on the location. That's true. Yeah, you can syphilis on palms and soles, and those mm -hmm. would need to be thick as anything. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. But the other pattern, the mixed infiltrate with the plasma cells, it was syphilis this time. So this is what the guy might have looked like, and if you wanted to do a stain, what kind of stains might you do here? T-pal. T-pal. And it was strongly positive in this case, so this was secondary syphilis. And also Warth and Starry, but T-pal is so much better, we just almost never do that anymore. Okay, so the last one, in the last couple of minutes. It looks like inflammatory at first glance, doesn't it? It does. So sometimes things break the rules. They look inflammatory, but they're really not. Could this be syphilis again? I didn't think it was. Good. <laughs> I. What did you think it was? I. I thought it was something very inflamed. <laughs> okay, um, what what did yeah. you think was very inflamed? That's good. But, um, I. You gotta have really sharp eyes. Yeah, I couldn't really put together like an nevus or something like. I I was trying to look for like. A, There's some halo nevus. Good. good. That's oh, great. That's exactly what it is. It's a halo nevus. But I. These are really the nevus cells here. Which ones? That's right a, here. Oh, those. And sometimes when it's so inflamed, it's very difficult to see the nevus cells. And how would you see a Meyerson nevus? Well, that usually doesn't give you this degree of inflammation. So here you just have basically a background nevus. It's really hard to see because most of it's being eliminated by the inflammation. Is so there also you, like BLK over at the sizer too with that uh, the other side? If you didn't have any history, yeah, you can okay. say that might be B. Okay, this is a really hard yeah, like example. Yeah, so I, if you didn't know trending. that this was a halo, if you didn't have information on this, you probably wouldn't, you know, make the diagnosis just blind because it's really hard to see the nevus cells. It's really not that big. Here's a nest. See that right there? Here's a little residual nest. So this is a difficult one. On a scale of one to ten, as far as identifying the nevus cells, this this gets up there. So basically, my, the problem is that I would see a few cells like the nest you showed. This one is too hard for the boards. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't see anything continuous to think, oh, this is the whole thing is an EVAS. So that's yeah. where I was like, okay, is this an EVAS or is it not an EVAS? This is a difficult case, and if they had this on the board, they would not. They would show you a picture and then show the clinic, or give you a multiple choice. So this, this one is too difficult to make without any information. So anyway, but, it, but this is what a halo nevus can look like when they get really, really dense and inflamed. You don't really see too many uh, lymphocytes on them. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, very good. You guys got them all right today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll do it again next month.